working with small and medium-sized companies. Up to uh, early expansion. Hmm? Thank you. We also have another person from the European Parliament. He comes from Germany. His name is Jorgo Schatzi Markakis. Been practicing on that. <laughs> And uh, he's uh, wa working with, the, or you used to be in charge of the competitiveness and innovation framework program. And you're also on the industry committee. And right here we have a man that came from California earlier this week. You're mostly staying in California. Jordan Eriksson from ESI Tech Trends. It's a business building services company promoting and uh, helping young companies like an incubator. And you're working with Scandinavia and U.S. companies, right? Yep. You also told me that you just recently got partner in a venture capital fund in the U.S. That's correct. Innovator Camp. Hmm? And... Not the least, but the last. <laughs> Johan Hellqvist comes from the company Accelerated. He's the chief operating officer and founder. And you produce data chips. And here's the man that can explain the Swedish paradox in a, a few more words. Charles Hellqvist, he's a professor and the holder of the Ruben Rosing Chair of Innovation Studies, working for Lund University. Give us a short uh, update on what the Swedish paradox actually Yes. Okay. Um, I first formulated uh, the term uh, Swedish paradox in 1993. That's 14 years ago. And it has lived a life since then. It has been discussed in, in, in various circles, not only academic circles, but also in, in various uh, policy-making uh, contexts. And uh, the way... Uh, we, it was Maureen McKelvey and myself, she is a professor at, of innovation at Gothenburg. Uh, we define the Swedish paradox very simply in a way that we in Sweden invest a lot of resources in, resources in uh, research and development and innovation activities on the input side, which uh, Marianne talked about. And at the same time, to the extent we can measure innovations coming out of the system, on the output side, the output is small. And we always have to deal with these issues in, relative, uh, uh, in a relative way. We always have to compare with other countries. It doesn't help if, if the Swedish situation improves, if the situation improves much faster in other countries. Everything is relative. Everything is competition. Mm -hmm. So this is, in short, the paradox. But it, it has also been used in very different senses. So... Uh, uh, we are trying to, to sort that out in, in this um, book, and then we call it uh, Reconsidering the Paradox of High R&D Input and Low Innovation Output. Mm -hmm. And that is a book uh, dealing with the national systems innovation of ten small countries in Europe and Asia, which will come out in two weeks. Good. Thank you. So here are the members of the panel. I'm going to start today with giving them some small different questions that they can discuss within and we'll see what the situation looks like today and then we're going to head over and looking forward. So, let's start with the table with the only woman round. Um, the situation today of Swedish clean tech in the world, what does it look like? Just go ahead. What do you feel? Lena, if you well, want to start. Yes, I can start. Um, I think there is also a kind of a paradox. Um, very high reputation, uh, not that much business. To sum sum make a summary from my point of view. And it makes me really worried. And I will give you two areas where I can't find um, the Swedish uh, industry and, and small businesses I, as I would like them. And the first one is I was uh, one of the main rapporteurs in the Parliament on the new chemicals directive in Europe, uh, the biggest legislation we've had through the system in, in Brussels. And, uh, of course, here is a new market um, for, for chemicals, 
the German, sorry, Schatze, <laughs> the German chemicals industry said that the innovation, invention circle, innovation circle was 20 years. Uh, and of course, it's great opportunities on a huge market uh, for safe chemicals or, or for tested chemicals. Uh, and the second one is, of course, climate. Where we, I was one of the persons that represented Europe on the Bali negotiations in December. And before, when we only talk, talked about the energy system in Europe, um, saying that we need more production and we need to rebuild the distribution system for oil and gas and, and everything, uh, and of course alternatives, um, the Commission estimated the market like... Um, well, huge. And then now we have the climate change as well. And everything has to be done all over again in the energy system. And, and of course, there's a lot of business there. But where are the companies? Where are the investments? Where are those who want to take part in this development? Uh, because in the energy sector, I think we have a, a new engineering revolution when we like the same, exactly the same thing as when we went from steam to electricity. And now we have to do it in a smarter way and more environmental friendly way. And that would change the patterns of industry and financial systems globally. And it's a huge, huge opportunity. Yeah. <clears throat> if you're in the stage that you want to go global, I think you, uh, I, I do think that there is uh, capital on the arena. But uh, very, I mean, it, it's not, you don't wake up one morning. Uh, realizing you should start a company and the day after you go global. It's, it's, it's probably a process of something between five and ten years before you do that. And it's, as far as, 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 far as my, um, uh, I mean, my experience is that in the first couple of years, then you have serious problems because uh, then there is a lack of, uh, quite, quite a lot lack of, of, of capital uh, which is needed to, to start up and start growing. The Swedish paradox, how can you relate to it? Reminds me very much the German paradox. <laughs> uh, and that's why I would first like to tell you that uh, you managed as a role model for all Europeans, especially discussed in Germany now, to reconcile economic growth with societal growth. Don't underestimate this, because uh, one day... Uh, to have a lot of societal costs will harm the economy. You won't have that. And you are quoted always as Sweden, as a role model in Germany. But nevertheless, uh, of course, there is the European paradox of investing more into especially research than to get out of it. That's a European thing. We call it the gap between the R&D concentration and the innovation cycle, because R&D, research, is investing money into knowledge. But innovation means turn the knowledge into money, get a product out of it, a service. And this is what doesn't happen in Europe in general. You especially, but also the Germans, we discuss too much. <laughs> uh, you know, we are, are philosophers, we, are, we, lo we love democracy, and we love to discuss technologies. Sometimes we emotionalize technologies to such a high extent that we stop it from the very beginning. Okay, we're going to spend a part of this day discussing things, but then we need to get to action. I realize it. Uh, Joran Eriksson, working abroad, mixing Scandinavian and U.S. companies. What's your point?